Hello, and welcome to the Brave New Weed Podcast. And now, here's your host, Joe Dolce. Welcome again, listeners, to the newest episode of the Brave New Weed Podcast. This is episode 69. I am Joe Dolce, your host. With me from Germany is Matthew Hendershot. Hi, Matthew. Hey, Joe. Happy to be back, as always, on the show. Super excited for this one. Uh, The interview is fantastic. This is a behind-the-scenes look at how the judges at the Emerald Cup make their decisions. And Matthew, have you ever imagined judging over 400 varieties of cannabis in three weeks? Can you imagine how one does that? You know, I've I've actually often wondered uh, a lot about it, and this interview uh, that we'll have on this show actually answers a lot of the questions I had of like how it's even humanly possible to go through. I mean, are you just sitting in a back room? Are you smoking joint after joint after joint? How does it even work? How would are you, you walking know? away afterwards? How about that? Like, how do you <laughs> well, how do you do that? <laughs> and continuing to be able to tell things apart after a certain point, yeah. It, it, it obviously just seems like a, a Herculean undertaking to participate in. Although I have to admit, uh, if my phone rang and they asked me to do it, I would leave at the opportunity. You'd be on that first flight there, right? So anyway, that's the episode we've got coming. And before we do that, I want to see if we have any news to discuss. What have you spotted this week? Anything at all, my friend? Well, um, there, I haven't seen much on the news. There was some bad uh, bad news that came out of the uh, defense spending bill this week, uh, or last week, rather, uh, which is kind of annoying. They went through, and uh, as they were shifting around their monies to try and figure out where they were going to put things for the defense spending, they actually ended up pulling out a lot of funding for medical cannabis programs uh, that helped veterans and uh one in particular was about um getting uh, access to to rental properties and and support in that regard for veterans who are on medical cannabis uh who can't get proper jobs and and that funding has been stripped away uh and then counter to that there's also a lot of uh money that's been shifted into actually continuing to fight the drug war um so that's that's out there but it's not um I mean, it's not a big surprise that, that that's gone on. And oh, it's just so can... depressing. I mean, why don't we just build one less submarine or one less airplane to drop bombs on people? This is or pathetic. How about, or how about one pathetic. less border wall? How about that? You know? How about that? How about that? And, and, it's and just, let's get it's our... Just all, it, it's, yeah, let's get our priorities in order here. I mean, these are people who, who fought for the country – uh, despite the validity or, ins- or sanity of the wars they were fighting in, they should at least be cared for. It's the yeah. very least we offer them, right? It's the least we should do. It's it's an extremely misguided sense of priorities that we will see again and again, especially well, as we regards are, cannabis. Yeah, we are coming into an election year. So if, if this kind of news that, uh, I'm, like I said, it's not a shock. It, this kind of stuff is rolling out of our current government all the time. Uh, but, you know, listeners, you have an opportunity now. It's an election year. You can make your voice get heard, get out there, get registered to vote, uh, you know, be vocal, be active, be active locally, because that's where you can make the most impact. Um, but really, like, if this is something that matters to you, like, sound off, you know, make noise, because the only way we're all going to get it done is uh, if we're all out there banging the drums together. Thank you for that inspirational talk this morning. That's great. Um, I did have uh, did have one other thing I wanted to talk to you about, Joe. What is that, um, Matthew? Last week, I took a trip to Berlin, and while I was there, I happened to Berlin visit... is that how, is that how Germans say Berlin? Uh, yes, maybe Berlin. Berlin. Okay. I don't know. Okay, Berlin. That's how we <laughs> anyway. say it. <laughs> uh, but I I visited. Um, Berlin's very first CBD shop and delivery company called Hemp Visor. Uh, I I went in. It's a cute little shop in the in the east of uh, the city of Berlin, and they have all sorts of great products as far as you know creams and drops and uh, tinctures and e you know e cig vape oils and gummy bears and all the stuff that you would expect to find but uh this is the first time in anywhere in germany that i have found a shop that is actually dealing cbd whole flower interesting Uh, where is it grow where do they grow it 
Well, I was talking to them to find out, and they said that their uh, supplier was a medical grow that was located in Italy. And mm-hmm. uh, it's been it's it's grown and produced in Italy, and then imported according to German import laws. the The restriction on CBD now in Germany is that you have to have uh, less than 02 percent content of THC in your in your product. Um, so it's so, even strict. It's even stricter than here in the United States. Is that correct? I, th- I think that's correct. I think it's point five percent. No, it's point uh, three here. here. It's it's point oh, three. Is here. it point three? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so it's point two here uh, to be. You have to be below the threshold. Um, I, I did buy uh, some fantastic uh, sublingual tincture that I've been using now, about forty milligrams uh, worth of drops a day. Uh, that's really nice. But they had something interesting. Um, Joe, you've heard of a moon rock, right? Yes. But tell us what it is. So, uh, uh, moon rock in the traditional dispensary uh, sense is, uh, you know, cannabis that's been broken down, uh, that's then rolled in wax to make it sticky, and then you know, coated in keef to make it more dominant, and it comes in a, you know, something you can break out and smoke in a pipe or put into a vaporizer. But they had a strain of what they were calling moon rock CBD. So this was CBD whole flower. Uh, buds that they had trimmed off that had been then dipped into the wax of the plant and then rolled in the keef to basically recreate a moon rock. And they claim, they claim on the labeling that this clocks in at 30% CBD content. That's a very, that's a super high, high number, isn't it? It, it is. Um, most of the time when you are buying uh, from a dispensary, you're dealing in stronger, um, you know, stronger concentrations around 15 percent. So you're, this is almost double uh, what would what I would consider to be the average, I guess. Um, and a lot of stuff is more like seven or eight percent when you're talking about whole flour. So what are you what are you using it for? Well, I'm using it for uh, anxiety, uh, certainly, and also for actually some muscle tension. Uh, I've been going through a very stressful situation right now uh, with immigration and and trying to work that stuff out, uh, and it's it's caused me to develop a lot of tension in my neck and shoulders. And when I really am sitting at the desk and I'm working a lot at the computer and I really start to feel tense and locked up, I'll actually go grind myself up a bowl and, and, and smoke a bowl of this. And it really helps me to relax the muscles in my neck and shoulders and feel a little bit better. So you're finding it an effective, effective solution then, huh? Yeah, it's, it's worked great for me. It tastes fantastic. Uh, really, really full, robust flavor off of it. And uh, yeah, it's potent enough that uh, it really helps you get a, a nice physical relaxation going on. It's helped me uh, get achieve uh, good sleep at night. It, it is, you know, finally a CBD that does calm me down into a sleep uh, place. And with even just having that 0.2% THC in there, if you smoke a whole bowl, I was definitely noticing some psychological effects creeping in there as well. Just a little bit enough to like shift perspective on a couple of things. But all in all, a really great experience. And I, I would encourage people uh, all over the place. They do ship. Um, I don't know if they ship internationally, but I know that they deliver and ship inside Germany, which I find super interesting. And if people want to find out more, they can go to hempvisor.com. Thank you, Matthew, for that European update. Really appreciate it. Let's move back to the United States, though, and talk about the Emerald Cup. So this is an event that I was lucky enough to go to several years ago. It was the first year it was at the Santa Rosa Fairgrounds. It had had really started it up in Mendocino County on one man's farm. The man is called Tim Blake. And he had the idea to bring a bunch of growers together to celebrate the efforts of their work uh, at the end of the harvest season. And it it, you know, it used to be a, a very small event, very local. There always was music. There was always celebration. There was always a sampling of all the products that had come in. Well, now it's a, it's a mega event. I'm sure Live Nation won't be far behind. Um, it takes <laughs> Let's place. Hope not, right? <laughs> it's just an amazing thing. It, it's it's sort of a mixture of a a science fair, a biker convention, um, a hippie gathering, Woodstock with no mud. Uh, it, it's just an extraordinary confluence of people and products and celebration uh, that really 
has grown enormously over the last uh, couple of years and is now in a, in a new iteration because of legalization in California. So it's a little less wild, um, a little less, uh, let's say, uh, it's a little more restrained, shall we say, to meet legal requirements. But it's still a fantastic, fantastic event. And honestly, I, I, whenever I ask anybody, have you been to the Emerald Cup? It, it's very clear to me that if they have, they are really – uh, really uh, true aficionados. Um, and no one has, I've never heard anyone say, yeah, it was a real drag. It's always <laughs> a, it's always a fantastic event. So uh, in order to, to sort of give you, give everybody a, a chance of understanding how this all works, I hooked up with uh, two people who I know very well um, who live in Mendocino. They have their own farm. Uh, they produce their own product. It's called Swami Select. It's sun-grown organic cannabis, uh, sustainably uh, cultivated and sustainably harvested. Uh, th- this is uh, two people. One is called Swami Chaitanya, and his partner is Nikki Lestretto. They have been judges for many, many years. They have survived it. They keep going back. Um, and they wa- I really wanted to know how this happens. And they're going to give us a blow-by-blow in this interview, which I found really fascinating and, and actually made me really jealous that I was not there helping them judge and determine the, this year's best cannabis strain. So really, without further ado, let me introduce you to Swami and Nikki, who are joining us uh, from their farm in Mendocino County, California. Okay, well, I'm Nikki Lestretto, and I am one of the founders of Swami Select and the CEO. Oh, fantastic. Swami? And I, my name is Swami Chaitanya. Uh, the full name is... No, no, I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm another co-founder of, of Swami Select, and uh, yeah, we're a half farmer. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm the farmer. You are what? A farmer? Yeah, I'm the one who grows the pot. Oh, I shouldn't say pot. I should say cannabis. You should say whatever you want, sir. And what is the name of your farm? Um, the farm where we grow it at, we, we usually don't like to actually say the name of our ranch or too many people will find it. But what we say is our garden is called Ganja Ma Garden. And Ganja Ma is the goddess of cannabis in Hinduism. Uh, so it's Ganja Ma Garden. And we're in Laytonville, California, in the heart of the Emerald Triangle. You are. And you're in a particular microclimate, are you not? Well, yes, we are in the sense that we are at uh, 2,600 feet elevation. We're about 30 miles from the Pacific Ocean. So uh, I like to say that we have the cleanest air, the cleanest water, and the cleanest soil uh, probably in the whole United States because uh, the Pacific Ocean is 6,000 miles of fresh air. There's never really been any industrial or even much agricultural development in our area within, say, 100 miles any direction. So we have really pristine soil, and we're also right in the middle of a, of a Douglas fir forest. So all of those are part of our climate, which makes us unique. And all of the Emerald Triangle has similar similar conditions. But one thing that is special about our place is we have our own valley. Most of the Emerald Triangle, especially around this area, is the farms are on the side of a hill, which means they might have a tremendous view, but they get different weather. So we're really in our own little valley of womb, so to speak, down here in our ranch. And we get we have a slight different weather pattern that's what makes the Appalachians so special and we're so um we really believe in the Appalachian system around here because each farm is unique so what Appalachian are you you're not burgundy you're not you're not gigondas what is the Appalachian of your of your cannabis variety well we're working on that the state of California is mandated to come up with regulations for creating Appalachian zones. Uh, I've been part of a committee called the Origins Council who's working with the state uh, regulation uh, committee to work on those actual uh, specific details. Uh, but the um, we are what we are calling the Bell Springs Appalachian, uh, and that's a, a dirt road that uh, goes up on top of the ridge. 
and goes from about uh, halfway between Leightonville and, and Leggett all the way to, uh, to Garberville. And it's a very unique uh, uh, geological and geographic area, meteorological as well. So we are Bell Springs Appalachian, but I have to say that is not official yet. <laughs> and so we're still working on those details. And just a, more, a little more specific, when those uh, regulations come down, probably in January, uh, just coming uh, January, then they will stipulate something along the order that each group of farmers that wish to be known as an appellation will need to gather together and create their own standards, their practices, and their recommend, recommended varietals, submit that petition to the state, and the state will then come back and either give them the, the grant the, the, of the appellation or uh, suggest some changes and so on. So that'll be a process that'll carry out over a couple of years. And I see the whole process of appellation as kind of a, what I call aspirational. It's something that people will aspire to to get that accreditation. But initially, the farmers themselves are going to create the rules and the standards. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, the other thing, yes, please, Nikki, go on. I'm going to say the other thing about Bell Springs Road that makes us special up here is this is really an area where a lot of the real OG original growers are coming from. And so they, you know, Hippies moved up here to Bell Springs Road in the late 60s, early 70s, and have been really perfecting the art of sensimia cannabis up here on this area. So it's, um, I like to call it the Beverly Hills of the Emerald Triangle. <laughs> it's sort of very possible to live on this road. But in, uh, in Mendocino County, uh, about five years ago, a group of us got together and created the Mendocino Appalachians Project. And at that time, we created a map just of Mendocino County uh, delineating 11 different zones, which we felt were as a proposed uh, separate different Appalachian zones. Humboldt County, I believe, is working on five different zones. Other counties are uh, perhaps a little bit behind in their specifications. Uh, but it's, it's actually within – the state has allowed the cannabis growers to have what they call county of origin. If you can prove that 100 percent of your crop was grown in the county, then you'll get a county of origin designation. We want to be finer than that. That's just simply a geographic indicator, and it says nothing about whether you grew indoors, outdoors, organic, or anything. So we're looking for something much more precise than that in the Appalachian zones. I think it's totally cool and I think it's great and I think it's fantastic to give cannabis the same sort of categorization and ennoblement that wine has managed to to take as well. So congratulations in advance on that. But the reason I've called you to the Brave New Weed podcast is to talk about – your judging of the Emerald Cup, which is still something that blows my mind. I'm sure it blows yours every every year. And I want to talk about that with you. So you have both been judges. So the, just for our, for our audience, I should explain. The Emerald Cup is the – I call it the harvest festival um, of, of, of the Emerald Triangle of all of California, I believe. Um, and it's really trying to judge the best varieties that are grown that year. Um, and award people various prizes. Is that a fair description, would you say, of what the Emerald Cup is? Actually, I'd like to add to that. The main thing that makes it unique is it's all sun-grown or outdoor-grown product, and it's all grown organically. So that's a very unique thing. This is not indoor cannabis. This is sun-grown cannabis, and all the products that are made from it, such as the um, concentrates and edibles and topicals and everything – come from what is originally sun-grown flour. Mm. So that that's a very different thing. That is a big But discussion. it is from all over. It, it is also from the entire state of California. So even though the, the bulk of the entries do come from up northern California, we've had people enter from all the way down to San Diego before. How many years have you guys been judging in the Emerald, in the Emerald Cup? Since it started in 2003. So this will be our 16th year of judging. So when I first heard about the Emerald Cup, it was described to me as Woodstock with less of the mud. Would you would you say that's a fair description of the event itself? Well, it depends on how much rain we have any particular year. Uh, in the old days, you see, the, the festival started out uh, as really just a harvest celebration, as you mentioned, uh, in 2003. And that was just 
maybe, uh, you know, we had 30 entries, I think, something like that. And maybe 200 people actually showed up because, remember, it was really still quite illegal in those days. And, and it was really kind of ballsy just to put this thing on. I really credit Tim Blake with saying, we're going to do this in advertising. And it was just in this tiny little place, Area 101, which is still there, still functioning, and still the home of the Emerald Cup. And then uh, the next years we had maybe, you know, 40 entries and maybe 400 people and so on. And uh, the, the most entries we ever had was a few years ago we had over 600 entries while it was still uh, in the semi-gray semi, uh, market zone. And uh, as a result, you know, now we're down because of legality, we're down to fewer entries. But everybody just kind of want and they wanted to be part of this party and just see well who grew the best weed is kind of the way it started it's kind of well, nice, we isn't still it? do yeah. this year we have um almost 400 entries in the flowers division they now are i'm not exactly sure it's something like 12 different divisions between all the different concentrates and the edibles and topicals etc um but they've also now divided up the flowers so we've got the bulk of them of course are licensed grower flowers there's also people that grow from their personal garden. I think we had 75 entries this year of people that just not even legal. They just want to know whether one of their six plants is a winner. Well, they're legal to grow six. The state of right. California says you can grow six. And then we also have mixed light, which um, includes light deprivation, and uh, but still grown mostly primarily outdoor. So those are the three categories that we have this year. So it's a little different where they used to just be all clumped together. And actually, there's a fourth category this year, which is kind of funny. They surprised us that they want us to do pre-rolls. Now, there's only five entries of pre-rolls, no and all of the judges kind of went, what? We don't smoke pre-rolls, <laughs> but we'll do it for them. Isn't that you know? nice of you? So tell me how it is that you are going to taste and test over 400 varieties of cannabis. Tell me how this works and how you survive it, basically. There's several, it, it's a little bit like March Madness, you know. There's a little bit like there's separate categories, you know. And so uh, we have um, – what we do is we go through when we first get them in our meeting. We just separate a whole bunch on the basis of uh, aroma, terpene, fragrance, and looks. And so we look at every entry and we pass that entry all the way around. Every every judge, the how many judges we have this year? Twelve. We have fourteen. This year. Fourteen judges, and so each judge you know looks and smells it and says yes or no that this goes through to the second round, right? Okay. And round so uh -huh. we can eliminate about half. And and one thing that we're doing, I mean, after sixteen years of this, Joe, I think we're finally getting it down. You know, you got a <laughs> bunch of stoners. To and it actually was funny at our first meeting this year. It took us about an hour to remember how we did it so well last year. But we finally <laughs> remembered. We better write it down this year. And one of the things that we do that really helps is we'll go through with all of those and actually divide them into categories so that you're not smelling a fuely one and then a fruity one. And then you can't remember, is this fruity one better than that fruity one? So we divided it into categories of fuel and gas, cushy, dessert. And fruit and tangy, those are the main categories. And then there's the mixed light gas and the mixed light dessert, mixed light fruit and tangy. And so we're kind of dividing them up that way. And that really, really helps because that way you're dividing, you're comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges, yeah. so to and speak. And tangy yeah. to tangy example, to tangy, like, really, right? Yeah, oh, that's right. That. So we separate sort of a tropical fruity out from uh, the other kind of fruity and then we have the gas. And, of course, uh, every year pretty much the mo most number of industries are gases. Uh -huh. and, and so that that's, uh, that's a way that we can uh, – so what you can do is you say all these are kind of gassy. Of those gases, which are the top five or six that you really like? And then in the end, you'll be uh, uh, you know, comparing those in terms of all the different ones, the fruity, the, the, the fuely, the, the desserts, and so on. And then coming up – now, so when we meet again on Saturday – uh, we will have uh, checked out all of those and then come back well, with our – Well, no, no. Saturday will be – we've gone through the first 100 right now. More right. We'll get them more on yeah. Saturday. Another 50 or 60 right. we'll get of the regulars. So on Saturday, we're supposed to bring in our top 
20 of the licensed and our top 10 of the other categories. And then we will have that 100 sorted through. Then we're going to take home another probably 200 that we're going through, 200 plus to finish it off on Saturday. And these meetings are... I want you to yeah, paint the, the pi- paint the picture of these meetings. Where so I, I, I have a bunch of questions. Obviously, like, are you all sitting around in a cloud of smoke? Um, are you all sitting around a table smoking together? Are you all vaporizing? Are you inhaling? Are you bonging? What do you paint this out for me a little bit? This is not typical. Uh, we pass them all around, and we set, But if you walk in, you'll see out on the counter will be like three hundred jars. 300 mason jars and they'll be the one like little jam ones that right right they'll be the little jam jars and they'll each have maybe a a half an ounce or something of buds in it so that's what we work on we get to see those buds and then uh well let me just say too so you've got actually the first thing we do is get to know each other we have a lot of the same judges there's a few new ones every year which is fun and then we you know once we get acquainted and we have all these jars facing Facing us, we'll actually start going through them, and everybody takes their own personal notes. And then after we've divided them up into these categories, we do sit down at a table. We kind of push a bunch of tables together to make a giant square so that we can see each other. And we'll all look at and this these things all take a lot of time to figure out over the years. And then we all um, start passing these jars around, like Swami's saying. Yeah. And At a certain point, of course, we start rolling the joints. Joints is the preferred way of smoking. That's basically how everybody's smoking is smoking with joints, except for me. I am the oddball out here this year, first year ever. I've been smoking joints for over 50 years, but um, uh, last spring I was diagnosed with having moderate COPD. So I'm now using the Volcano. And it's kind of a good thing, I'm finding, because... It actually, there's a lot of people out there that do smoke their flowers through a vape. So I'm able to give a slightly different skew on the judging here. And uh, we all agreed that was fine to do. So I'm sitting in the little edge of the table with my volcano and they're all smoking the joints and everything's getting passed around. And yeah, before long, you can't see across the room. Yeah. Well, there's one, usually there are a couple of the judges happen to have their, their mold and mildew radar finely tuned. And so those will be the judges say, hey, I found some mildew. And so, you know, that one we'll, we'll, we'll put out and so on. And then, you know, there's usually one, like one of our judges really knows the names of all the terpenes and says, oh, this one's is mostly myrcene and this one is mostly beta carotene and so on. And so there's a whole lot of expertise there. And so we're really, really dialing in and, and focusing down. Yeah. And and to explain who the judges are and how we pick them. I mean, in the old days, it used to just be basically Tim Blake's friends. But we've gotten a lot more specific now. Um, for example, this year we have uh, one of the uh, founders of SC Labs, which is one of the main testing labs. We have a couple of main buyers from some very large clubs across the state. Um, we have farmers, of course. We have several farmers. Um, we have what else do we have? Um, well, there are people who make oils and concentrates. There are a couple of them, yeah. right, because they can't judge the oils and concentrates because they want it. You can't enter. Obviously, we cannot enter our flower because we're judging. So we do have some judges that make other things. But one of the things that we do try to do is to get sort of a geographic spread of the judges. And uh, lately also, we've been going down younger and younger in the judges. Uh, Nikki and I are now the uh, resident geezers on, <laughs> on the panel. Uh, but uh, you know, we do have a whole sort of range of you know, you know, geography. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a very good panel. and Excellent. Really excellent. And, and, and one of the things that every one of the judges after a meeting says, wow, I learned some things today. Mm. You know, people who are pretty considered experts are always learning and that's one of the great things about the cannabis business that we're always teaching and sharing so are you smoking a hundred joints a night are you tasting a hundred joints a night? tell me tell me the the amount no, that you're no, no. that you're inhaling please um out of i would say if you wanted to know how to, for example if we have 400 entries i would say that swami and i together will preach has sampling actually tasting Probably about 150 of those, I would guess. Yeah, yeah. Because at a certain point, Joe, if there's no smell, it's out. It's just terpenes are so important. Forget it. If it's really poorly trimmed or it looks like, come on, guys, you're entering a competition. Make it look pretty, but it's not. Forget it. They didn't put the time and effort into it. So we are able to weed out, literally weed out a few of them from the start. And then we get it down to the ones that we really want to test. It's on the last night that we really 
have to try every single one of the finalists over and over again. And that's the hardest night of all is the last time we're together to actually put them in order. Like we might say, like, we love these 20, but which one is number one and which one's number 14, for example? That's the hard part. Over the years, we've found that the top 50 kind of just automatically uh, show themselves, and everybody pretty much does agree on a top 50 yeah. with few outliers. But like Nikki just said, to get them down in the order of the top 20. But one of the things that does always amaze us judges at the end of the contest to realize that virtually every year the top three that finally win are in everyone's top 10. Mm-hmm. And this is something that's just we just how can this be true? But it is true because it's, you know, it's a subjective judgment. And yet, you know, the cream rises to the top. You know, we just, you know, it's just clear. And so the way there's a certain people, how can we judge so many joints in a day? Well, the point is that you've eliminated those. Now you're going to roll it up. We've gotten through. You're going to roll it. Now, when I'm rolling it up, I'm likewise testing how well is it dried and cured. Is it too dry or or is it too wet? That'll mark down. And then maybe I won't even want to smoke it at that point. This one's so dry it can't win, even though it had a good smell and a good look. And then finally, when all of them are, you know, we decide, okay, I'm going to smoke this one. And there are times when I'll take one or two hits. And in the past, when Nikki was smoking joints also, she'd take a hit and say, no, I don't want to smoke any more of that one. So that one doesn't get high points either. But the ones that you really, really want to smoke all the way down to that last tiny little nubbin, those are the ones that actually end up being the winners. And there's a certain way in which you reach a plateau, yes, a toleration level, you're all sort of, and then all of a sudden you smoke one, and but a boom, you get another level, and that's the one that gets the points. So on right, that last, so on that last night of judgment, of judgment, the judgment night, how many uh, varieties are you actually sampling? Well, we don't know yet, but we actually sometimes call it the Supreme Court, uh, and so on the last <laughs> night of judgment. <laughs> Uh, what did you say? I would say that on that last night show, we pretty much everyone's brought in on the last night. You bring in your top 20 and then we actually do a spreadsheet situation and we just really count them out and we put extra weight on if it was somebody's number one choice, because we have to bring in our top 20 in our personal order of how that is. And so then we'll take, if somebody says number one, that's going to get three points. If they say number two, it gets two points. If they say number, or is it there's a no, four no, or three, wait. one. No, I, I, okay, I, explain that. I, I'm the arithmetic here. <laughs> so what it is, we get the top twenty. So if, if you have a, a sample that you decide that's your number one, that one will get twenty points plus an extra five points for being your number one. And that's kind of like I said, like the seeding process in, in the uh, in the uh, March Madness. So we all know that this one's you know is uh, is a top rated. So then your number two will get. 19 points plus three, your number three will get 18 points plus one, and on for every judge in that way. And what that does is that it separates out the winners because we don't know how much more you liked your number one than your number two. So we're giving you that extra. And when we do that, the the, the winners, the number ones just pop out really, really, mm-hmm. really obviously. Yeah. And, and the other thing is that um, to answer your question of how much do we actually smoke like per day, I would say um, when we're full gear like we are right now, we can do up to about 18 samples a day of actually smoking them, the ones that we don't just look at, but we actually smoke. And it actually, like Swami says, it works. I mean, people say, how could you possibly do 18 kinds of weed a day? But you can, because like you say, the, the really best ones jump out of that and you know. And we're keeping notes. We keep copious notes. We ask all the judges to do that and about... What did it look like? What did it smell like? And we're not saying it smelled like Kush. We're saying it smelled like um, a a gym locker room or it smelled like um, kiwi fruit. We're trying to make it some things that people can actually relate to so that you really figure out the differentiation. Understood. Um, Yeah. Is there there a bias in in, in California for more sort of – Mercini, Beta Caryophyllini, OG uh, smelling cannabis than I typically like. I tend to prefer a more piney, a more lemony sativa type, if you will. Um, do you think there's a bias in the state against, uh, against those sativa ones in favor of those heavier, more couch locky uh, varieties? 
Well, you know, we've had both win the cup before. We really have. And and what I find is it kind of goes in cycles. Like, for example, this is very interesting. Last year, the winner was a very fruity one. And so a lot of entries this year were very fruity ones because I'm sure people thought, well, that's what's won. Last year, I'm going to plant that this year. So people go, they learn a lot from the cup. and they, It depends on what they're going to grow the following year. But I say the flavor... People here like a little bit of everything. Um, we've certainly had sativas, strong sativa smelling ones winning before. Well, wait, wait, I don't like that sativa word anymore. No, uh, I don't yeah, either. I, I don't either. Here. Go on. So what do you want to call it? <laughs> well, we're talking about the different kinds of flavors, and we've come up with some categories over the years. Like there's kind of a new category we're calling the desserts. It's not new, of course, but those are the frostings and the wedding cakes and the Girl Scout and, and all, that, all yeah. those kind of things. And you might be wait what the we're frostings and the I'm sorry the, the frostings and the wedding cakes. What are you talking about? What is that? <laughs> Those are names of cultivars that have been popular in the last couple of years. They're they're very popular out here. They're wedding cake, vanilla frosting, for example, or different frostings. Right. There's different kinds of cakes, not just wedding cake. Right. Um, gelato would gelato, be one that goes yeah. into the. Gelato, yeah. I know about gelato yeah. and sherbet. Sh- sherbet. Sher- 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 oh, yeah, yeah, sherbet. Well, sometimes the sherbets can go into the fruities too, you know. So yeah, but uh, yeah, we've got. And then one year there was almost all tangies, you know, yeah. and so that became. So it seems like they're phases. And as Nikki sort of indicated, the winners, the top twenties of the Emerald Cup, they end up selling more seeds for the next year, right? Because people want to follow and so on. And of course, the Appalachian, what you're going to grow if you're going to grow a wedding cake somewhere here, it's probably going to taste different than if you grow it in the in the in the Sierras or, or down in Monterey mm-hmm. or something like that. So give, give, that's give the a, Appalachian. Te- give me a, a description of wedding cake. What is? I mean, wedding cake sounds like sugar. I can't even imagine it has a taste. What are the What are the terpene profiles of a wedding cake, for example? Well, the wedding cake is. I, I couldn't tell you the exact terpenes offhand right now, but I could tell you that it's a very kind of mild, almost like doughy flavor, I would say, with a little bit of a sugar thing to it. So it's not nearly as strong flavor as a Kush, for example, or a real heavy fuely one, but it is almost a sweeter taste. And um, I, I have to say it's not personally my favorite, <laughs> um, but it, um, it's, it's just not quite yeah. as stony as some I find. But some people like it. And, you know, the demographics of the people smoking these days is really changing um, I was just told this morning that this is very curious that for the Emerald Cup this year, so far of the tickets sold, sixty percent have sold to women. This is very unusual. It used to all be, you know, guys, the guys, you know, the guys with the pants falling off their ass. But now it's not, and it's really changing the demographic. So probably a lot of those women like the cake, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's a more mild yeah. kind of flavor. So people are the growers are likewise catering to what the public's going to like, especially in the license growing section. Yeah, you were asking about the, the mercine and beta carotene. Uh, the, the Alec uh, Dixon, that's the last name. Yeah, here, who's uh, one of our judges? He was there last year too. He he's one of the founders of SC Labs down in Santa Cruz, and he's really got his his uh, terpene categories and all down really good but they have this data that they've been collecting of for 10 years i think he said they've done fifty thousand tests or something like that from that data approximately 50 percent of the entry of those sampled are high in mercine yeah and more than anything else right and uh, you know pretty higher percentages and then the next one i believe is beta carophylline and then there's alpha pinene is the one which isn't the true pinene and then the lemonine also isn't really citrusy. Those are the top four that, that show up from their statistics of their, you know, crunching their data. So, uh, and that's why we're, we're talking, our, our names of fuely, uh, fruity, and all of that, those are terpene names. That's why nobody's talking now uh, amongst us about sativas and indicas because the fact of the matter is, although certain uh, terpenes tend to more often show up in something that would have narrow leaves and others might show up more often and that have wider leaves, everything up here is so much of a hybrid over the last years. This is kind of categorize them in the left and right. Doesn't make too, doesn't give you a lot of information. That's for that sure. Way. No, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's it's very clear to me that that's the case. Um, how has the event I have been, I went to the Emerald Cup maybe four or five years ago. 
Um, how has the event itself changed over the years? I know how what it started as you know this little homegrown thing on in in Tim's farm, Area One Hundred and One. But what's it look like now? Can you can can you paint a picture of that for us? Like we've gone um, we've gone from little Area One Hundred and One to the Sonoma County Fairgrounds in Santa Rosa, which holds more like I mean, last year we had over thirty thousand people over the weekend. So it's much bigger. And what's really astonishing to me is the booths. I mean, people spend people spend about thirty thousand dollars on their booths up to that for these big booths. Most people make where we used to all have little ten by ten booths. Now every booth is at least ten by twenty, if not bigger. Um, big companies really have the money to make them very flashy and very fancy. It used to be much more simple. Um, it also the other difference is. There used to be a, I mean, it used to be illegal. So um, we only started actually selling. It was, I believe, the second, no, was it the first year at the Sonoma County Fairgrounds? Casey O'Neill from Happy uh, Day Farm said, Hey, Tim, can I actually sell something here? And Tim said, Give it a try. And he um, had a few jars and he just took weed out of these jars and he did a killing, of course. So, of course, the next year, everybody wanted to do it. And that's when Tim was able to get some sort of permits for people to do this. Um, but it was still sort of semi-legal. So, you, I mean, the last year, Joe, it was amazing. In 2017, which was the last year before it was legal, right before it turned legal. No, no, no. no. Yes, it was December of 2017, that there were people walking around with – so openly selling pounds. These guys were walking around with pounds oh literally God, yeah. pinned to their person and just selling it. Everything was like, this is our last chance. Get it out here. Um, and, you know, it's, that wasn't approved by the Emerald Cup, just to make that clear. But that was happening. And it was really much more of a free-for-all. But now things have had to get very much more um, organized. You have to sell through a distributor now. So behind every booth or set of booths, there will be a distributor set up. And that distributor brings out the product that you can sell and keeps track of every little thing and makes sure the taxes are paid and the, everything else. So, so it's really a, a different ballgame altogether, very much so. Do you feel that it's yeah, less fun that. now that it's legal? Is it less fun for you guys? Um, I'd say it's a different kind of fun. I mean, it used to be at the original ones, we used to really enjoy the judges would all sit in the back room for the first hour and roll up lots and lots of joints of the winners. And then when we'd go out to announce the winners, we would actually pass those joints out among the crowd because the crowd was maybe 500, 800 people or something. And we could do that. Obviously, we can't do that in a place where there's 30,000 people. And plus, the, the announcements are in a room where you can't smoke. Yeah. So we can't do that any longer. So things like that aren't as much fun. But yet, it is fun in the sense that all these people, People can come experience it now. They could not have come before. Yeah, and yeah. they can get some, a medical card. They can just walk in if they're over 21 and do this. And that's very exciting for people to yeah. be able to share this knowledge and, and the fruits. But of I labor. want to point out also that the uh, the Emerald Cup is really uh, is one of the very, very few of these conferences where you can actually smoke on the premises. We go to NCIA, CCI, all these other places, and we're still out hiding in the parking lot to, to you know, to burn a number. And, it, you know, that's it. But here at the Emerald Cup, we're all about the consumption. And not only that, but you still can meet the farmers and so on. Right. So in right. the early days of the Cup, that there was, you know, when we, we were still starting out on Area 101 up in Laytonville, and there was a maximum capacity, maybe seven, 800 or something. And one year after about four years, there was one single vendor who just had old fashioned memorabilia, old pharmacy, apothecary jars that said cannabis on it and so on. And then for one year, we moved up to the Mateel Center up in uh, Humboldt County, and that was bigger. And then there were some vendors. And then the first year down at, at uh, at, at Santa Rosa Fairgrounds, of course, we only took over about a third of the fairgrounds that year. And there were there were any number. And as Nikki said, Casey sold. And Casey just brought down five big uh, mason jars full of weed. Then he had to actually drive home that night and go back and get some more because he was <laughs> selling so much that day. <laughs> that was crazy. But now what's happened, the whole professionalized level of the, of the event has come much, much uh, a higher level because uh, this group Red Light Management came in, and they're the ones who run these gigantic festivals. They work, uh, they help out and work on 
uh, all these other festivals. So now there's a whole more professional level, and it's not muddy anymore. I do want to point that out to people. <laughs> we put the two years now. We put this floor down, this plastic floor that kind of interlocks together, almost like Legos or something. And so you have this entire plastic floor over the whole area. So please be advised that it's not muddy anymore, and also it's going to be good weather this year. This is great. Yeah, no, it's really it's. It's very comfortable. In fact, what we're doing this year, instead of um, we're not having a booth actually because we're just not we're not doing a booth. What we do is we work on this, something called the Area One Hundred One Lounge, and this is about you know we we really really work hard to continue to have the Emerald Triangle vibe at this event. So it's not MJ Biz Conference with a bunch of guys in suits. It's not it's not um, High Times, which is a whole different sort of situation. This we try to do it. So in our lounge. We have a very, very big space. It's 60 by 20, and we're going to have it all decoed out and comfortable and couches, and Frenchie Cannoli will be there um, doing hash with his hookah, and Swami will be there rolling joints the whole time, and it's just a place to hang out and get high and meet the farmers and get a chance to talk to people like the judges and um, Tim Blake, and we're going to have an elders circle this year which is featuring the original growers that we are coming out to talk about the old days. So we're really, like I say, trying to maintain this whole feeling of, um, of the old days, the good old days. The legacy, we call it, the heritage growers that we want to honor. Uh, people have been doing it longer than we have up here. We've been up here for about 20 years, but there are people who were up here for uh, long before that. And taking all the risks and, and being true heroes hidden in the underground and uh, carrying this, this ancient uh, herb and this ancient medicine, this ancient elevating of consciousness forward into the, into the 21st century. I want to ask you guys, you live on a you live on a farm uh, and it's a large farm and is it a self-sustaining farm? Well, you know, it's really hard to say. Nothing really is these days if you want to get really particular because we have a car and we have to go to town sometime to get some supplies and that takes gasoline. We have we are totally off the grid. We have um, we do have our own satellite dish. That's how we're speaking to you now. But we are told we have our own solar power system. We have our spring water. You know, we're completely off the grid. However, during harvest season, it's cold. It's it's cloudy. So our solar panels are never going to supply enough power. So we do have a backup generator that requires gasoline. So just to be a lot of people like to use the word sustainable. And I'd say that we are probably 95 percent and sustainable but i do like to be honest and say that yes we do have to use gasoline along a certain point yeah part of the problem is the word sustainable isn't defined and everyone wants to make their own definition of it so that they fit that category but we are you know we are working to be uh what we're working with is called regenerative agriculture and there's a whole movement particularly among cannabis growers particularly up here in the north and all the way up into Oregon, Washington, even into British Columbia. And these are people who are trying to source the nutrient ingredients that we add to the soil, source those ingredients, if not immediately on your own farm, uh, but as locally as possible. And that also goes with the idea of the terroir, that the things that go into you know growing and feeding your plants are things that are locally sourced mm-hmm. as much as possible. So uh, as once again, as Nikki said, no one is 100% that way. And anyone who's really honest about what they're doing say, well, I'm striving for that. We're working towards regenerative agriculture, the whole concept of permaculture and how do we sustain this. And I want to say that this movement of regenerative agriculture has real importance for the, all the rest of agriculture, which is chemical, petrochemical, uh, industrial agriculture pesticides. Uh, with pesticides and everything else. And, and that's actually poisoning the soil uh, of uh, the agricultural areas of the states. And so regenerative agriculture, if it can prove that it can feed the masses, is the way to save our soil and regenerate the soil and, and keep agriculture alive for the future generations. Yeah, I, I really want to admire you. I want to give you props for that. Uh, we just had um, David Bronner on on the episode prior to this, and he's a big supporter of regenerative agriculture also. But listen, I, I want to thank you guys so much, A, for for doing good farming and doing good practices and starting that, and B, for keeping the Emerald Cl- Cup uh, authentic and alive and true to its – True to its original colors. It really matters. Um, and it, it is, for me, the best – I wouldn't call it a conference. For me, it's the best event in the world of cannabis 
ever that I've ever seen anyway. So I, I think you're great. And I think it's really terrific that you're keeping it going in, in, the, in the same way it started, the same spirit. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. And and one thing I really want to make clear for people to know, it is 100% blind judging. Okay, so I really we really like people to know that we have absolutely no clue the number that we get on the little we get like a little small vial that has the bud that they give us to take home. That number is not the same number that the person got who entered the contest. There's no way that we know who grew what we grew, what we are testing. So. People really like to know that and be assured it's completely blind. Yeah. Oh, and another thing also, Nikki mentioned that we have like, what, 15 or 20 different contests, right, for edibles and tinctures and salves and so on. Sometimes people think that Nikki and I judge all of those. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, no, it's enough of a responsibility, enough of a great honor and privilege. All we do is we test the various flowers that come in. There are separate judging panels for the edibles, the tinctures, the salves, and all of those, the concentrates, and so on. And they also do a really incredible job. And I would have to say that probably one of the most difficult things to judge are the edibles. Yeah, yes. probably. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Because you cannot judge 18 edibles in one day, right? Let's face it. Um, yeah, that takes some serious time, I'm sure. I'm sure the recovery period for edible judging is a little longer. But listen, I, I want to thank you again uh, for joining us and have a great time at the Emerald Cup. Um, let us know everything about it. And um, thank you so much for joining the podcast. I just want to go come on. back again some years soon. I want to say one thing for Tim Blake, who's the organizer and founder of it. He also really wants to keep that Northern California Emerald Triangle vibe that we bring to the city. So we're always very grateful for Tim and everything he does for the cannabis world. No, I, I think it's true, and I think it's great. So, so thanks again, um, and Thank let you. us know, let us know what happens. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much, Joe. Yeah, it's been a great talking to you. It's been a great privilege. Thank you. Thank you. So Matthew, are, are you now jealous that you are did not get on that plane to go judge oh. the Emerald Cup this year? So incredibly jealous. It does sound uh, just like a really fun experience, and also just a really personally education uh, educational experience as well. Like learning how your own body interacts with all that stuff, and and going through it. One of the things that stood out to me the most is that. There's a big percentage, a big chunk of the submissions that they don't even smoke. If it's like we open the bag and it doesn't smell good, you know, it's out right away. So there are so many submissions that they don't have to sit there. And then the other bit of it was like you're, the, the nose knows and the body knows. And it's like if you hit the joint and you're like, eh, you know, I don't really want to hit that joint again then it, it immediately starts to drop down but then there's the ones that they talk about that they're like i want everything that this joint has to offer pass that back around my way again i want to hit that one again i want it again i want it again and uh it's really interesting how they have that as a shared experience and the fact that they all come to sort of this odd conclusion to where they all do their own thinking they all do their own judging but there's so much overlap and they're like we've never had a situation where somebody picks a top three winner that's not in everyone's top 10. It's clearly a very scientific process that has been honed over many years, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, it has to have been. You almost <laughs> wonder, uh, it would almost be a great joy to be a fly on the wall around, you know, round one when they were still figuring it out. And like, you can just imagine if everybody was splayed out on couches being like, we really have to rethink how we go about doing this. <laughs> well, you know, you can look at the, I, I think we have some photos of this that are going to go up on our Instagram as well as go out on our blog. So people can can really see uh, what it looks like and no nobody seems to be splayed out on any couches they all yeah, seem to no. be working sitting at that table working just like every other corporation in america well and another great thing that the photographs show is just how diverse the group of judges are like you look at that picture and you see that it's just people from all sorts of walks of life and all sorts of personality types that are in there working together just to let everybody know what the best weed you can get is it's really hard work, and somebody's got to do it. I'm so glad these people are sacri <laughs> sacrificing all of that time and energy to doing this for all of our greater good. So anyway, 
Like I said, Joe, uh, I suppose that next year, if the Emerald Cup needs a couple people to martyr themselves, uh, you and I are waiting by the phone, right? We are volunteering right here and now. I'd actually love to go out and and cover some of that judging um, and do a couple of live podcasts at the Emerald Cup. So let's put that on our docket for next year, okay? Absolutely. Listeners, I want to thank you for your support, for listening, and also for supporting us on Patreon. It's really important. You guys are helping us keep the lights on and keep going, and we really rely on your support. It really matters to enabling us to do this podcast. So if you're so inclined, if you have some extra dollars this holiday season, and please, only if you have some extra dollars, please consider, uh, consider contributing to us uh, as Patreon supporters. If you go on to patreon.com forward slash brave new weed, you'll find all the different levels of contribution you can make, and you can really help us with even as little as a dollar a month. Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, come back in a couple of weeks, and we'll be on with another new episode. It was great to hear, uh, great to talk to you, Matthew. Thanks for joining me. Always a pleasure, Joe. You know it. Keep on with that CBD and let us know if it keeps on working, okay? Will do. Have a good day, listeners. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Brave New Weed Podcast. This episode and all future episodes are made possible by amazing listeners like yourself. If you like what you've heard, we encourage you to show your support by giving $1 a month for special access and rewards on patreon.com slash brave new weed. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram via at Brave New Weed. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Brave New Weed. And remember, you can always find more information about us or information discussed in each episode by pointing your favorite browser to bravenewweed.com.